So, so we're very pleased to welcome Keith. Um, he's from Electron Electrical and Electronic Engineering. He's co-director of UKIRK. He's, um, he's a chartered engineer, a uh, power systems engineer. He works for the Scottish Government, the Republic of Ireland Government, Northern Ireland, off GM and with DEP. So, um, and so, so he, had, he has a very broad aspect. He, he was formerly a, a member, uh, working in the electricity industry itself, so he's got a very broad experience that he's going to share with us tonight. Okay, thanks very much, Paul, and uh, yeah, good to see everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me. <coughs> gonna, it's, it's funny, I guess you get lots of people come in and they, they can't make a presentation without the prop of PowerPoint. Uh, so I'm afraid I'm the same. I, I lose confidence of doing anything without PowerPoint anymore. I need to have everything there in the room reminding me what I was going to say. So I'm going to be looking a little bit to the side <coughs> all the time, so please forgive me for that. And uh, I guess people a lot of the time will be asking, uh, are the lights going to go out? Uh, it's going to be a disaster when that happens. And I thought I'd turn it around a little bit and say, well, how come the lights don't go out more often than they do? Uh, what is it that's going on? And, and are we really right to be worried? Or are we worried about the right things? And um, maybe, given the theme of the lights going out, maybe we'll be illuminated by the end. Or not. Uh, so as Paul said, I'm from the University of Strathclyde. Uh, for all you people from the southeast, it's up north. Um, <laughs> I had to, actually, I'm from the southeast originally, as you can probably tell. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was actually, it was a, an institution was founded back in 1796 by a chap called John Anderson, who was, uh, he was an academic at Glasgow University. And he made a point of describing <coughs> this new institution as the place of useful learning. So you can guess from that what he thought of Glasgow University. Uh, but anyway, so we, we have a particularly a kind of a science and technology and humanities sort of theme. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of topical, isn't it? I mean, there's been stuff in the press. Every autumn, it tends to kind of get, it, get a bit uh, you know, raised in, in the media, mainly because people are anticipating what might happen over the coming winter. And National Grid, for example, the, the electricity system operator, publish a winter outlook where they try and give some idea of what the risks might be, whether it's worse than last year or better than last year or whatever. And there are a few things that have been going on in the last couple of years that seem to have grabbed even more attention the norm, especially actually in 2013. So uh, I don't know who Gary Smith is, apart from he works for the GMB union, but he said, this very tight margin shows that government energy policy is in disarray. Just the sort of thing that you like to see quoted in the newspapers. If there's a cold snap this winter, the only way to keep the lights on is to shut down a large swathe of British industry. Uh, assuming there are large swathes of British industry still here that should be shut down. This isn't a policy, it's a shambles. And uh, from the British Chambers of Commerce, uh, Adam Marshall waded in as well. The prospect of energy shortages and rolling blackouts is simply unacceptable. I would agree that it is unacceptable. As they may cause major disruption for British business, but too long the UK has failed to plan adequately to guarantee the energy supplies required for our economy, businesses, and consumers. So, um, I guess the people in National Grid who finally, when it comes to real time and actually operating the system and keeping the lights on, might be forgiven for sometimes <laughs> looking a little bit concerned. So why is everyone getting so excited? Uh, well, there is some analysis that's done to try and uh, you know, quantify the risk. And uh, one way of looking at it is in terms of the margin. So Gary Smith talked about what he regarded as being an inadequate margin. What is that anyway? Well, it's a measure of the total generation capacity relative to the peak demand. And in the last few years, people have started using a derated margin. We've got generation that has different forms. The availability of power is different. Wind, you know, the average capacity factor of wind farms, depending on what year it is, somewhere between 20% and 35%. Average capacity factor from a combined cycle gas turbine, you would hope it's about 90%. So it's an attempt to kind of weight these different types of generation roughly the right way and come up with a derated margin. And certainly it looks like, this is some off-gem off assessment, or some assessment they commissioned, things are not looking too healthy. You know? <laughs> 3% margin of available generation over the peak demand. That sounds like a small number. A more kind of precise way of looking at it is in terms of loss of load expectation. So if you looked at it probabilistically and you understood all, you know, modeled all of the uncertainty, in how many years, in a typical, how many hours <coughs> in a typical year, would you expect there to be not enough generation available to meet the demand for electricity? And 
it, you know, we can see there's a, a strong relationship with the capacity margin mm -hmm. when there's less capacity. The, the number of hours, on average, that you would expect to not meet the demand is higher. So we can see 2015, 16, that's how it looks. And these are different scenarios that have been articulated by National Grid based on how the, the energy sector might be developing new generation capacity. And where these things have really come from is a particular concern about fossil fuel generation closing and not being replaced with anything. Well, wind farms are being built, but they don't have the same kind of reliability value. Why are they in closing? Well, largely because of the large combustion plant directive. Uh, you know, old nasty coal stations closing down, which from many perspectives is the right thing, but if it's not being replaced with something else, maybe there's some legitimate concerns about reliability of supply. That dashed line in the middle there, that's what uh, the UK government has decided is the right level. You know, the level of this loss of load expectation should not, on a kind of year ahead basis, be any lower than three hours per year. That's what they've set in the standard that's driving the new capacity market that had its first tender round just before Christmas. So yeah, what does that mean? Well, here's um, the pattern of demand for electricity for the whole of Britain on a particular day. This was uh, the highest demand day that I could find in the last 10 years or so. It happened to be uh, December 17, 2007. And these are kind of different settlement periods along the bottom. So energy is traded typically on half hourly basis. So this would be about sort of six o'clock in the evening. Um, so that was the highest demand day, and the highest point of that day, that's the highest demand point of that year. So when we're talking about a capacity margin, is there enough generation to meet that demand for power in that interval of time? So another way we can look at it is what happens if there isn't enough? Uh, well, first of all, the system operator should try to reduce demand where it can. It will have some contracts in place where consumers, maybe large industrial consumers in particular, have agreed. Uh, and it means pay some money to be ready to have their demand reduced by a certain amount. So they will make use of those contracts. Uh, the other thing, that, next thing that the system operator will do will be to kind of uh, use maximum generation, exceed the normal continuous ratings on some fossil fuel plant. Get a bit extra out. They don't like to do that for very long, but under emergencies, they will do that for, for a bit. I'll give an extra few percent. We're interconnected with the rest of Europe. It's two connections to, uh, one, one connection to France, one to the Netherlands, there are two connections to Ireland. They might be importing or exporting at that time. They will try to increase the import if they can, again, to kind of meet the shortfall. Another thing you can do is just well, reduce the voltage that all of us as consumers receive. So effectively dim the lights a bit. Uh, so that, that will happen. And it's only as a very last resort they might actually disconnect people. <clears throat> so that three hours in a year is just to get to the first level. To get all the way down to this level, it's somewhat less than, on average, an hour a year, one would expect. So. Um, you might actually turn this around and say that's a rather conservative standard if you're spending too much money on it, but we'll see if we get to that in the Q&A. So um, how we can tell whether we've got enough generation to meet demand is actually by looking at the system frequency. So we're all used to the idea we have a 50 hertz supply, uh, but you can look at it's never, or very rarely is it exactly 50 hertz. So if we happen at any moment to have more power being generated than is being consumed, then that surplus will be used to speed up the system. So it will be a bit above 50 hertz. And if there's a deficit, it will be a bit below 50 hertz. So as well as having enough generation available, actually you've got to get the timing right. The system operator and the generation companies have <coughs> to bring on the generation and bring it off to match that daily demand profile at just the right times. Why is that? Because we don't have very much storage capacity. We've got some pump storage, we can use some surplus electrical energy to pump water up a hill uh, in North Wales or in the Highlands, and when there's a deficit, we can let it back down the hill and turn a turbine. But it's relative to the whole size of the system, that's pretty small. You know, electrical energy storage is just expensive. So actually, it turned out to be cheaper to schedule the generation to ramp up its output and ramp down at just the right times, and there's this fine tuning to, which we can see by virtue of the of system frequency, just to get it right about 50 hertz. And the system operator is under a legal obligation to keep it always within plus or minus 0.5 hertz. 
Now, what happens that kind of disturbs that is something you might have heard of called a TV pickup. Have you heard of that? Yeah, so here's a, here's a nice one from a couple of years ago. I know how to make friends and influence people, so when I presented this to uh, my students in Scotland, I say to them, well, I was looking for an example of Scotland in a big tournament, and I didn't manage to find one. If, I still, if I'm still alive after I've said that, can I describe this slide? So, um, you know, this line here is kind of the day before. Oh, no, see. Um, the, yeah, the day after, actually. Sorry, the day after. So this is the demand for electricity. So it's on that axis on the far side. So it comes from about 32.5 gigawatts for the whole of GB. And this axis is describing the system frequency. So we can see that it's wobbling around. But this is the demand on the day of this football match. And what we can see is that at half time, the demand jumped a lot. So that's maybe equivalent to, what is that? That's about, uh, oh, it's not that much, about a gigawatt and a half. So you're starting up a whole, you know, whole of Drax power station, getting it going from nothing to full output in a matter of a minute. Now, actually, you can't do that in a matter of a minute. To go from Drax power station from nothing to something of that level takes a couple of hours, at least, if, assuming it's warm already. If it's cold, it takes you 24 hours. So that's my point about the timing. You've got to get the timing right for these things. So they actually have somebody who sits in the National Grid's control room whose job it is is to watch the telly <laughs> to get the exact moment when the first half finishes or there's a commercial break or whatever it happens to be push the button on the pump storage to let the water down the hill. Actually, they will slightly overspeed the system, if you like, beforehand. And then as the demand comes up, they'll kind of meet it on the way down and uh, get some extra generation. So that happened at half time. And why is it a big pickup? People are switching on the kettle. They're also going to the loop. Uh, the water industry is a big consumer of electricity as well. So everyone flushes the loo. All this sewage actually gets through to the system. Pumps are starting up. So, you know, big jump in demand. So it's, uh, it's all kind of scientific, really. Make a cup of tea, drink a cup of tea, go to the loo. <laughs> and we can see it at full time as well. That pickup would have been bigger. I don't know if you remember that match, but that was the one when uh, England's goalkeeper was Robert Green and he let that little trickle through his legs. Uh, I'm sorry, the ball I'm talking about. Um, so that would have been even higher, but a lot of England fans have thrown themselves off the top of the tall buildings rather than guys making a cup of tea. So timing is the point, really. So you know, it seems to me, actually, that while there is a risk that there might not be enough generation available at the right time, it's also got to be called upon at the right time, mainly by the system operator. And this is a bit of a cartoon of how they might make sense of that. So um, if you have to, if, you know, the, the, the worst risk, actually, that TV pickup of the demand going up is a risk, but the biggest risk is often a big power station suddenly suffers a fault and goes out of service, it trips. And then you've now got a shortage of generation relative to demand and the system frequency falls. And that's what that red line is trying to show there. So what they need is some, something to respond to that, to automatically increase the output to try and reduce that, you know, arrest that fall, and then replace the lost generation with some reserve that's already spinning or can be started up very quickly. So they have to get just the right amount of reserve, really, because actually it costs money. If you've got some power stations that are running, part loaded, they're not the most efficient, you've got to pay them to be available, and well, how much money are we prepared to pay as electricity consumers just on the off chance that not just one event, but two events might happen? Um, okay, it's a bit of a risk management decision to be made there about the cost and the probability of something happening and what the consequence might be. And to illustrate that, here's an event this is the only one I can think of, actually. I haven't looked laboriously through the records of actually having a shortage of generation relative to demand. But it wasn't because of lack of capacity. It was just to do with the timing. So while they carry enough response and reserve to deal with one large power station <coughs> tripping, they don't carry enough for two. It just doesn't seem worth it. The probability is so small that they won't spend the money on the reserve. And here was an occasion, May 2008, when uh, one power station tripped, and you can see the system frequency fall a bit. And then just a couple of minutes later, another bigger one tripped, and the system frequency fell below that limit, that lower statutory limit of 49.5. As it happened, just a few minutes later, something else happened, and at the time they didn't know quite what, to send it down even further. 
Now that would send it down to 49 point, sorry, 48.8, where now you're into kind of panic stations because you can have a frequency collapse, a whole system collapse if you don't do something pretty quickly because the demand is this what the demand is. Uh, so there are some backup systems that are installed, which will, if it detects the system frequency goes down to a certain level, will automatically disconnect some of the demand, called under frequency load shedding or low frequency demand disconnection. And the first threshold for that is 48.8, and that's what helped it to recover. That first step kicked in. There were seven different steps to get rid of some of the demand. That's enough to restabilize the system, and then it could recover it afterwards. So this was out of their initial report, and I thought it was quite amusing actually. They were very coy about which generators they were to begin with. So they just say generator A and generator B. But within a few hours of it happening, the Bush Telegraph was telling everybody what was happening and which stations they really were. So the second one was Sidewell B down in Suffolk, a pressurized water reactor that tripped. I don't know why, um, but these things happen. Uh, so yeah, this extra four down here, Afterwards, it was reckoned that there was some small scale generation that was connected within the distribution system <coughs> that National Grid doesn't normally see, just sees the net effect, doesn't see explicitly what their outputs are, that had some protection settings that were actually incorrect. And that tripped as well, and it really shouldn't have done that. At least it would reveal and they could fix it. So hopefully it wasn't going to happen again. So, yes, yeah, so there are lots of load expectations. It's just looking at the, and that system frequency balance. This is looking at the system as a whole, total generation, total demand. But what we should also do is a look in a bit more detail and think about where the generation is relative to demand. It's not all in London. Not all the demand is and not all the generation, very, li very little of the generation is. So if you're going to keep the lights on in London, you need to import the power from somewhere else, where the wind farms are, where the coal stations are, where the nuclear stations are. So you might have some other limitations imposed on that by the network. The network becomes important in getting the available power to where it's needed. So you know, we might look at a particular part of the system and say, OK, on the system as a whole, everything's fine. But when you zoom in, you can realize a particular area has a certain demand, and the generation that's available, or that the market has scheduled to run, is less than that. To meet that demand, you have to import from elsewhere on the system. <coughs> So the design of the network is governed by some analysis of that import requirement to a large extent, certainly in terms of security of supply. But the network might go wrong. So here's an example of the network kind of going wrong. So this uh, situation in Europe in 2006, in, uh, I don't know which, which one it was in there. Um, anyway, the, one of the system operators in Germany had received a request to switch out part of the transmission network, so an overhead line, a double circuit overhead line. And the reason was it was over going over a river and there was a big ship that was due to pass along this river. And at the time it was arriving, I think it was high tide, and they were a bit worried about how close it was going to get to the overhead line and the risk of an electrical flashover. So they had to study it and say, right, well, to be on the safe side, we better switch out the line. Can the rest of the system cope without that double circuit? Yeah, we think it can. We think it can. Tomorrow, round about 10 o'clock, should be fine. Yeah, go for it. So they had a forecast of what the power flow was going to be the next day. That's what's shown in red. But inevitably, by the time it actually came to pass, things were a bit different. In particular, it was windier in Germany than they were expecting. So all the wind farms were operating. They're nice and happy, generating lots of power. What it also meant then was the export of power out of Germany, uh, westwards towards the Netherlands, eastwards towards Poland, was higher than expected. And the power flows on some of these critical circuits near to where this outage was, uh, was also higher than expected. So that's just showing that kind of chain between what was, what was forecast in red and what they actually were seeing in blue. So uh, they just wanted to switch out these two circuits at the right time that the ship passed by. So uh, yeah, these two circuits are kind of forward to the other, the red and the white circuits. So when you switch out the red one, the, white, the loading on the white one goes up. And you switch out the white one, and that goes down to zero as well. And there's another circuit shown in blue. That's the loading increased by quite a lot. 
actually a lot more than they expected. And they then started worrying that it was getting near to the, the limit. I mean, you've got the physical limit on these things. They don't want to get it too hot. You then got a risk of a fault, and all the power that line is carrying is carried by something else, and that then gets too hot, and that trips, and you have a cascade, and you could, you could in principle, lose the whole system. So they had to look at this very quickly and very carefully to decide what to do about it. They couldn't, they, they weren't confident they could just let it wait for the demand to reduce or the wind speeds to reduce that were driving this power transfer. So they made a decision about what they should do. They decided to kind of do a particular switching action on the network, which they thought would reduce the loading. Unfortunately, it had the opposite effect and it went up. So within a matter of seconds of them taking this action, in fact, two seconds, that other blue line tripped. So the protection operator said, right, we're overloaded, we need to switch it out for safety reasons. And this cascade I mentioned happened. Within 15 minutes, this system operator in Germany had succeeded in doing what Nigel Farage would probably give his back tooth to do, which is to split Europe <laughs> into three parts. So, you know, it's the speed of it, I think, that is, is so kind of noticeable here. And Actually, some of these same automatic devices that I mentioned earlier at 48.8 hertz automatically tripped 14 and a half gigawatts of demand. That's equivalent to about a third of the GB demand right now. So within 15 seconds of this action, then you also had equivalent to a third of GB's demand being, being disconnected. A part of that was, you know, this split, you ended up that some of these regions had but this one had too much generation, it was actually exporting. Now you split it up, it's got nowhere for that export to go, it's just there, it's a surplus relative to its own demand, and these two were importing, they haven't got the surplus from the other region, they're now short, so they've got this under frequency, and that's where the load was automatically disconnected. So, by my estimation, that was about 9% of the demand at the time, and maybe 20, 25 million people would have been affected. But on the other hand, in some ways, it succeeded. Yes, the initial decision made by the system operator was wrong, but the automatic defense mechanism worked. It could have been a lot worse. It could have blacked out, in principle, any one of these regions. Some people were disconnected, but because, in a sense, some demand was sacrificed, uh, they were actually able to get it back to normal operation within a couple of hours. Much easier to kind of stitch it back from a system that's already operating than from what they call a black start. So I guess what I'm saying here is that the network itself is a large, physical, dynamic, non-linear system that's a bit complicated. And it needs some careful analysis. Here's another example. In the US in 1996, there was an event, again, quite a sort of seemingly innocent initial fault event that is not unusual, and yet it led to Two million people being affected, you know, more than 11 gigawatts of demand. This time the restoration took a few hours. Started by, yeah, an overhead line trip. Actually, it was made worse by some other protection settings designed to safeguard the system that maloperated and made the thing worse. So a voltage collapse in this case took place. So uh, this, we'll call N minus two, two outages. Not normally studied. You look at N minus one and check that everything's okay, but at N minus two, it doesn't normally happen. So um, you're going to spend money safeguarding against it? Normally the system operator doesn't. Yeah, so the normal kind of analysis and modeling of the system that they would have done would have, if they looked at the N minus two condition, would have shown a voltage problem, but they wouldn't have shown how quickly it happened. So that, again, is just a matter of seconds the voltage to collapse at one particular location and across the system. The other thing that was a bit worrying was when they went into a more detailed kind of model than they would normally do in a control room, uh, you know, a more sophisticated thing, they couldn't reproduce the event. They set up the same initial conditions, the same fault, they didn't get the same responses. So the model, even the most detailed model they had, turned out to be inadequate. So, okay, at least they could then find it and they could tweak it and tune it and improve the model. So hopefully, anything similar might come again and it might be all right. As it happened, a month later, something did come again. <laughs> Albeit the mechanism was different, much more demand was lost, many more people were affected, it took longer to restore. Uh, yeah, the 
high temperatures, so the temperature of the conductor gets, gets higher. So uh, the, temp the conductor expands, the sag is bigger, you've got a risk of a flashover now. Vegetation management, that means you know, what you've got under an overhead line out in the countryside is some trees that suddenly grow, so you've got a risk of a flashover, and that's what happened. And the system operator didn't really look at the new condition and what might happen next. And again, there was a cascade, further outages. Uh, but there were also control devices that normally make the system operator's job easy, but in this case made it much harder. So automatic generation control is AGC. There's some high voltage DC, a bit, bit like what we have connecting us to France, that had some control systems on that designed to do particular things. Actually, they, in this case, made it worse. And again, the standard detailed models fail to reproduce the event. And here's just an illustration of that. This is what they measured. This is what the model told. <laughs> I don't think we need to look very carefully to see they're quite different. But again, it was an indication that they had to go back and refine the model and try to spend months trying to work out what, what was going on here. Uh, fortunately, these initial conditions happen very, very rarely. But it just shows when it does happen, it can be pretty bad. So how, of, how many of these disturbances do we get? Like I said, this is kind of normal, at least for a single circuit outage. This is typical for England and Wales in any one year on the transmission system. 100 single circuit faults might have two double circuit faults. So you're used to seeing these towers, very tall things with uh, three sets of conductors on one side and three on the other. Well, you've got three phase systems, so that's two circuits, one on either side. You might have a fault on the tower or there might have high winds and the conductors clash, so you might lose both. So actually in Britain, the system operator looks at that case of loss of both <coughs> circuits of a double circuit, even though yeah, that's only two of them a year out of you know, 7,000 kilometers. So is that over it, or is that a sensible precaution? A lot of these faults are weather related. Um, so, you know, about half of them in, in Britain typically. Uh, so, okay, I thought every day and a half or so, the operators trip more often. I, I failed to get some exact data on that, but my feeling is it's about every day, on average, a power station or a unit of a power station trips. Uh, but the most common cause of a fault uh, would be lightning. Another common cause would be uh, sleet, snow, blizzards, and ice. And you can see particular years, so on there, 96 and 2001, seemed to be quite bad winters, and there were faults due to sleet, snow, blizzards, or ice. So it does vary year by year, depending on the weather. Okay, so the system operator is trying to anticipate any of these bad things that might happen, and then they know to take action to mitigate the consequences. But there's a huge number of possible things that might, might take place and a huge number of possible responses. And they're trying to understand all these sort of different phenomena. But as I've kind of asked this question already a couple of times, what's an acceptable risk anyway? Because to do something about it costs money. Build extra network, schedule more reserve, how much are we prepared to pay? Well, you know, if you did this mathematically, you might say that risk is the product of the impact of something happening and the probability of that thing happening. So we could try to analyze it. But for a transmission system, the, the impact could be very large. It could black out the entire country or a large part of it. Because of the design of the system, the probability is usually very small. I mean, I haven't got any big examples from Britain, fortunately. How do we quantify that probability anyway? I mean, you know, it depends on the weather, it depends on all sorts of complex interacting factors. And what are we prepared to pay for <coughs> improved reliability? So, yeah, we, we could build more network and it will help. I mentioned that already about building the network to meet the demand in the southeast or, uh, yeah. So if we haven't got enough generation locally, we can use, and there is some available somewhere else, we can make use of it. So, yeah. That's the kind of typical pattern of power flows in Britain, generally from north to south. Uh, so, um, yeah, if you're wondering why you need the north, this is one of the reasons why you need the north. So be nice to us. Um, but also, the network facilitates competition. You want to be able to make a choice, make a choice between a, you know, different generators, ones that are expensive or cheap, ones that are clean or dirty. We need the network to facilitate it. If you haven't got network capacity, you're forced to use whatever one happens to be on your doorstep, whether you want to or not. 
Now, because of the market, actually, even if you do build network capacity and you think that gives you more margin, it might not mean that because the market will just gobble it up if that's facilitating the cheapest transfers. So building extra network capacity doesn't necessarily improve your reliability of supply. But also the design of the network has an influence. So the transmission network, because it's carrying a lot of power, it has a high value, you know, the consequence of a loss would be big, it's worth spending money building in some redundancy, which means multiple parts. It's a meshed <coughs> network. You lose one line, there's still another one that's connecting you. The distribution network is not the same. Much smaller in the units, there's smaller lumps of demand, and there's a lot of it in total at the capillaries of the system. It's probably not worth spending all the money and all that redundancy. Okay, if there's a fault, someone's going to be disconnected, but it ain't going to disconnect the whole system. So that's sort of something we maybe have to live with in terms of the costs and benefits. Okay, so I said at the beginning that people are getting excited and saying, oh, things are getting worse. This capacity margin is dreadful. It's going down. Uh, well, actually, it's kind of always done that. Yeah, it hasn't been planned. There's been no central planner determining what the generation capacity needs to be or where it needs to be. If you're left to the market to deliver, but it has jumped around a lot. We finally kind of lost confidence in the market in a sense and said, well, we do need a bit of planning. Let's set up a, a capacity mechanism to make sure at least we have some minimum. And maybe that is sensible. But it's not true that it's suddenly worse now than it has been. At least in respect to that kind of loss of load expectations you know, whole of the system perspective. So, how often do the lights go out? What is our experience? Uh, hands up if your supply, either at work or at home, has been disconnected in the last year. That's not that many, actually. Okay, get your hand up if it's been more than once. Oh, you're very unlucky, sir. <laughs> do you have any idea why it happened? Um, well, it would be a local substation. It was just a couple of streets. Right. And that's normally what happens. That, now that is most people's experience. <coughs> so, loss of supply due to a fault at transmission level, okay, maybe 40 events in a year of varying sizes, of varying durations. The National Grid likes to talk about how much energy is not supplied relative to the energy that's carried and come up with this crazy percentage. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, it doesn't tell the whole story because if something, if they didn't do their job properly, you could black out the entire system for set. On the other hand, the average experience in Britain is that we, if we're going to lose supply, it's because of a fault on the distribution network. And that's a consequence of the way it's designed, and it's a consequence of the costs and benefits of having redundancy in there to a very large extent. So this is kind of typical figures. And the distribution companies do have an incentive to improve that. Uh, you know, they, can, they can earn a bit of money if they reduce the number of interruptions or reduce the average duration. But of course, they're going to value, you know, weigh that up against the cost of achieving that outcome. So, as I've said this already, you know, faults can happen, understand their impact, and it depends on the design of the system. The transmission system is designed to be sort of N minus one secure. You can lose one element and you're still okay because it's high value. Bigger groups of distribution, you know, supply London, yeah, N minus one secure, or it should be. Uh, it was anyone trapped in a London Underground train in August 2003 when the supply was lost from the London Underground? It got a lot of excitement and attention. Ken Livingston was there kind of shaking his fist at National Grid. Um, actually, that wasn't an N minus one secure supply. Uh, as it happened, it got a lot of attention in the media in London. By sheer coincidence, there was a similar size of event in Birmingham just the week after that got no coverage from your London centric media. <laughs> But you go right down to the smaller groups, it just doesn't seem worth making it N minus one secure. <coughs> so yeah, if we experience a loss of supply, it's probably down to distribution. Big stuff can happen though, when it happens it's big. And actually some researchers in the US looked at loss of supply events over there, and you can see this sort of log law, where in terms of you know, measure the energy not, su not supplied as a consequence of the fault on this axis, and the probability of it happening on that. And you, you can see this kind of relationship, kind of, kind of interesting. But distribution hasn't got completely off the hook. They've been getting some bad press as well, um, both this winter and last winter. Um, so yeah, most of the time, it's kind of a fixable thing. There is a, there's a bit of redundancy, especially in suburban or urban areas. 
where you can reconnect via the kind of back door. They're normally kind of some split on the system just to make it easier to operate. You can reconfigure it and get, get some other supply back. Um, but if you're out in the sticks, there isn't another supply. There's only just one line that's connecting you. And so especially in the highlands, uh, that was the experience over Christmas of last year. Differing opinions here from some of the authorities. DEC seemed to think that actually the distribution companies did okay, and Ofgem thought they didn't. So it's good to know that the regulators are in tune. Um, so, you know, again, is it worth doing something? We might look at the size of the asset base, you know, how big are these systems, how much do they cost? Transmission, okay, things get depreciated over time, so it's not the rebuild cost, but about 6.6 .6 billion pounds is the asset base for transmission. That many circuit kilometers in total include all the Scottish networks. Uh, whereas for distribution, it's much bigger. So if you're going to do something about improving the reliability of the distribution system, it's potentially a lot of money that you've got to spend. I think it's just what I'm trying to say. But what else could we do? Well, maybe we could zoom in on those storm events and those you know, big disturbances and see if we can do a bit better there. It might come as some surprise that the system operator, the network operator, doesn't always know exactly where the fault is. It depends on what kind of protection kit is in there. Some type of equipment you can detect where the fault is, and you can isolate it and leave everything else in service. Other, other times, cheaper, older stuff uh, isn't so sophisticated. So one of the things that Scottish and Southern Energy is doing is a contract with a company called Open Grid Systems, which happens to be founded by a Strathclyde graduate. Um, proud of that. Um, where it's allowing any member of the public to take a photograph on their, on their phone and using the GPS locational system that, that can then send it to the, the network operator who can then work out where the fault is. And if they've got a photograph, they can then identify the type of fault. They can match it back to their asset register, so where it is on the network, how it's connected to everything else, and also get a bit of an idea of what equipment the repair teams might need to bring with them. So this sort of sounds to me like it could be pretty good. So there's some screenshots from the prototype of, of Alan's software. Um, but you know, it's a logistical question. You know, what personnel are available to go and do the repair? How many have you got available at the right time? The DNOs, distribution network operators, do have some kind of mutual support arrangement because they're not going to carry staff who spend most of the time not doing anything. But they'll all be on standby. I mean, you know, there are managers and stuff who will be told, right, you're on standby tonight. We know there's a storm coming, so don't think of going to the pub or whatever you're going to do. Be ready with your phone. You might have to come out and join in. They do do that. And they should also support their neighbours, you know, the different distribution areas helping each other. Maybe it still isn't quite good enough. Maybe, like I said, they could be more sophisticated about what they're doing. But there's other logistical issues. Like if it's a storm that's blown over these wood poles carrying the lines, it's probably also blown over trees that are blocking the roads. So how do you get through there? And how do you communicate with these people as they go out? Do they know where they need to go? Can they let you know back in the control room if they haven't got there? Well, the mobile phone masks are supposed to have batteries, but some of these events you found out that they're not very well maintained. And you've lost the landline as well. That's blown over. Yeah, as I said already, what equipment do you need to make the right repair? You've only got a van of a certain size. Because you need to get down this road. So actually a lot of this is kind of kind of not electrical engineering. It's not power system operation. It's sort of about logistics, but still important. And have we got more risk of these kind of events in the future? You know, what's climate change going to do? Are we going to see more adverse weather? Or is it going to be more extreme when it happens? Do we need to change the design standard of overhead lines, of wood poles, of the conductors? Not sure. So these fault events come from the network. We could actually kind of pause a little bit and say, what does the network cost as a proportion of our electricity bill anyway? So this is some numbers from Ofgem. They kind of update this approximately every year. Um, the point here is that distribution and transmission together represent 20% of your bill. It's a lot. It's a lot of money, you know, whatever it is, thousand pounds a year. It's not trivial, but it's not the biggest chunk. Uh, that could be another debate about what is the biggest chunk and whether that's reasonable or not. But, um, and we do okay in Britain relative to other countries. You know, in, in Australia, for example, it might be half of your bill is because of the network. It's because it's a big place. 
the network connections are very long. You've got to pay for it. Now, how am I doing on time? Oh, okay. So again, well, I should be finishing. Um, there are some new things that are happening. It's already a bit of a challenge. Some things are changing, as I'm sure you're aware. You know, the nature of generation is changing. We're, we're getting rid of fossil fuel plant. Um, some of the nuclear stations are going to be closing end of life. What are we replacing them with? Well, at least some of it is renewables, highly variable in its output. The kind of the, the electrical characteristics are quite different as well. I mentioned on the slide there, non-synchronous generation it has different kind of behaviour from the generation that we're used to. So what is that going to mean? One of the things it's likely to mean is that when you have a disturbance, a loss of a big station, that system frequency drop that I mentioned before will be steeper or quicker. So are we still going to manage to keep the system stable? It's highly variable, uh, and because we haven't certainly got good electrical energy storage, you've got to replace it at the right time with something else. So here's just an illustration of, you know, if the wind power drops off, and you're still going to meet the demand, well, you can try and ramp up the output from combined cycle gas turbines, which needs to get the gas from somewhere. So that places a demand on the gas system, much bigger than we've seen before. Now, you can manage that gas storage in different places, but you've got to anticipate it and spend the money to put the facilities in the right place. And all these different controls, electronic controls, are interacting. That thing I showed back from the US and the West Coast, it's an example of that, unanticipated control interactions. And we're getting more, okay, with very clever controls, that are very flexible and fast, but if we can't understand their interactions, they could lead to adverse outcomes, not just good outcomes. And here's just an illustration of that as well, some unknown wobbling around that we've got to somehow manage. So maybe what we could do to kind of improve our reliability of supply is implement a smart grid. Hands up if you've heard of a smart grid. And keep your hand up if you think you know what it is. <laughs> okay, Paul, what is it? It's using various information technology to manage your network. Very good. Any, any other bits? Anyone no. else want to have a go? Is that, everyone happy with that? Different. Choice to manage the demand a bit better. Choice to manage the demand a bit better. Yeah, good. I like it. Yeah. Manage the generation better. Manage the generation better. Yeah, okay. A smart grid is the answer. <laughs> These are all the answers. Um, I'm not sure there's real precision on what is the question. <laughs> so for me, the question is about, okay, we can maybe try to improve reliability of supply. In the US, that's a big motivation for smart grids. Uh, but I think here, actually my feeling is that the reliability of supply is not bad. Does anyone disagree with that? No, it's not bad. I mean, and as I said before, we got to, if we want to pay more, we could get more. But, so let's take that as a given. We don't want to, at least I don't want to get it any worse. Let's, let's take what we've got, but we've still got to decarbonize the system. So how can we do that at least cost? And yes, it's, you know, I said already, renewables are highly variable, they're quite uncertain. A lot of nuclear generation is not very flexible to deal with that fluctuation in demand. So yeah, part of it is about not just flexing up and down the generation and scheduling it in the right way, which you know, we need to be clever about. Maybe we could flex demand a bit. Um, yeah, so these are the elements of it. And it, you know, it's about utilizing the assets in the most cost-effective way. Now, to do that, it does seem to need a lot more automation. It does seem to need a lot more uh, information. A lot of different active elements, especially if you're going to make use of the demand side. There's lots of consumers. Are we all going to contribute to <coughs> some substance? Well, whatever, it's going to be a bigger number of active participants than we have now. This is an IET document that tries to sort of describe the scale of that in terms of the amount of extra active elements and the amount of extra data that needs to be gathered and used. And it depends for me on you know, observability of the system. I said already that not all, this, not all of what's going on in the distribution network is visible minute by minute or second by second. To know what the limits are and know what's available to be used. And yet we, we shouldn't be overburdening the system operator. Maybe they can put a lot more people in the control room, but they need to work together. So. I mean, that's not the right answer. Maybe we should be using decision support tools to help them. And a lot more automation to help them, provided we can design it correctly. There are you know, earlier examples of where the design turned out to be incorrect. 
So actually, I think the smart bit is in the design of the controls and the targeting of the right kinds of investment. And that, in turn, depends on the right kind of funding mechanisms. And the network operators are not always very good at paying for innovation themselves. You know, They want to minimize cost. That's another debate we have. But it particularly depends on expertise. You know, the methods, the tools, software tools in particular, data, and people. And then, other element is trust. You know, different systems produced by different manufacturers that have to work together and to be able to prove that they work, they do work, get the confidence. These are these full statistics I mentioned before. I'm drawing your attention to one part of it if we're going to talk about a smart grid. The number of protection or communication failures. That's a very large number relative to the faults on primary assets. And we're going to make the system more dependent on automation and communication. Maybe we need to think about how to do that. Um, so yeah, it depends on knowledge, doesn't it? The expertise, people. For me, I think this is the, the biggest challenge. If I, had to, if I had to distill it all down, that's where I would get to. But um, is Ofgem helping? Well, Ofgem thinks it's helping us. That's what it wants to do. It's shaved seven billion pounds off the expenditure allowances for the net, for the transmission companies, actually, in this case. So National Grid is one of the transmission companies that were most affected. Its response to that, it said, announced very proudly to the stock market, uh, we are focused on meeting our regulatory commitments by operating efficiently. <coughs> what do you think that means? Um, downsizing used to be the term. Maybe that's the right thing to do. Maybe they can do it and do it successfully. Where's the expertise coming from? You know, as an academic, as, a, as an educator, that's something I'm really interested in. Uh, it's difficult to read from the back, but here's the number of people starting higher education courses in engineering. Expresses a proportion of the total number of students starting higher education courses. The green line is engineering as a whole, all kind of subtopics. You can see it going down. Maybe it's a bit harder to see in here. Is electrical or electronic engineering? So as a proportion, that's a big drop. That's people starting in the last, no, I haven't updated it since then. It's starting in 2009. If they carried on, they would have graduated last year or the year before. So it looks like the supply of electrical or electronic engineers at a time when certainly for the power sector, the challenges are getting bigger, the supply is going down. And in absolute terms, that's a 40% reduction. And one response to that that the power industry has used, which I think is a very, very good thing, is called the Power Academy, where a number of companies have clubbed together on a common scheme. And it's the old idea of sponsoring undergraduates, to try and encourage them into the power sector, give them paid summer training, give them a bursary, try and get a, build a relationship with them so they will come and work for them when they graduate. <laughs> and Strathclyde is one of the universities involved in that, one of eight. And uh, if oh, just one of eight, we, we happen to provide 30% of the students on that scheme. Um, yeah, how is, this, how is the industry organized? It's quite fragmented. There are a lot of different parties. And in terms of all those technical issues I described earlier, there's a whole plethora of standards that supposedly govern them. And they've sort of worked to date. But some people are now getting worried about whether they quite fit together, especially when things are changing. So there's a group of uh, people assembled by the IET who are now recommending something they call a system architect. Not everybody has the same understanding of what that means, but I think what they're saying is something to at least make sure that the standards cohere and things can work together. They're not going to design the system, they're not going to be an old CGB planning system, at least they're going to make sure that in principle everything can work together. So, yes, our experience of unreliability comes from distribution networks, and these customer interruptions and customer minutes lost are reported annually. They have an incentive, but they don't publish a detailed causes. So it's quite hard for independent researchers, such as me, to dig into that and understand why and how those occurrences can be better managed. And yeah, as I said, I think maybe things are getting harder now. And we don't, I don't know quite what the effect of climate change would be, but there are some projects going on looking into that. So my last slide you can hear for, and everybody, if you want to go and get a glass of wine. Um, I don't think things are really as bad as some people would have you believe. At least I don't see the evidence of that. 
Um, but you know, it doesn't mean to say we should be complacent. Things can happen and do happen. We should make sure we manage them the best we can. And part of the reason why things can be very bad is just the fact that power systems are large, complex, non-linear, dynamic systems. And to, you know, fortunately, custom and practice has been developed over decades to manage that. And most of the time, it works. But yeah, things are changing. Some new investment is needed, is going on. Uh, could it be better? Smart grids might be part of the answer. New technology is being introduced. But yeah, are there enough skills coming through to manage all of these uncertainties and keep the lights on in the future? That's it. Thank you very much. great journey through <laughs> electrical system resilience. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions now. Uh, please put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, if you are asking a question, please tell us what your name is, where you're from, and most importantly, please be brief so we have time for lots of people <coughs> to ask questions. Um, hi, my name is Amy Mountain. I'm from the Alliance. Um, uh, but, but due to the decolonization agenda, a lot of people are saying we need to phase out the whole at least in the early 2020s. Um, and there's resistance to that from some political parties slash people in government who say uh, that's just going to compromise security supply and lives go up. Um, to what extent do you think that argument is justified? I'd like to start off with an easy question. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> I, well, I mean, it's not impossible to manage. Okay, I'm an engineer, I'll say, well, yeah, we can make that work. Cost you, but you know, it can be made to work. And um, I guess to be fair, that's part of the reason why the capacity mechanism, the capacity market, has been introduced is to try to ensure that closures of generation are replaced by okay, the longer term openings. At the moment, it's just paying people to pay generators to still stick around. Um, getting the timing right so the investment can come through in the in kind of in the short term, most people talk about combined cycle gas turbines replacing the coal capacity that's lost. So that's not perfect, obviously, from a carbon emissions point of view. You're still burning fossil fuel, but it's, from that point of view, it's better than burning coal. Uh, you know, you're wondering where you're going to get the gas from, and we were very worried about that up until just a few months ago. Uh, you know, supplies, okay, we're not directly threatened, perhaps, by uh, whether the gas is coming through from Russia and Ukraine, but the UK continental shelf has not got as much as it used to. So we're looking kind of enviously across the US at, at uh, the fracturing of, of underground reserves. And they're not quite sure whether we like that either. But if we're going to keep the lights on, we've got to make some compromises. So it might be burning gas. OK, the gas prices have fallen dramatically in the last few weeks, and maybe we're not kind of, kind of as worried as we were. But technically, we can make it work. There's, I don't think any problem. I think it's just about the right kind of investment at the right time. And that's what's led to some of these market changes. Uh, from a carbon emissions point of view, gas is better than coal, but it's, for me it's only really a transitional thing. But well, other people get excited about carbon capture and storage, and that's maybe for another, another discussion. Does that yeah. help answer at least a little bit? I mean, others will have opinions on that, I'm sure. Gentlemen, back on. Hi, Alan Burns, Gloucestershire. I work in the renewable industry and I'm looking towards energy management. I work on the other end of the cables to you, mainly in the domestic market. And there's a lot of excitement, buzz, and speculation about how smart meters will evolve and be implemented. I understand the government has mandated to install them everywhere. Speaking for me and my buddies in the small scale renewables and micro generation industry, we just don't know what they're going to look like, and nobody we know, nobody we ask knows either. And I was hoping from all this way to find out what they would be, because that's what people at the small, smaller end, the domestic and small commercial end, are going to build their infrastructure around to help take the demand off the operators? Yeah, I think you make very good points. Um, I haven't followed all of the development of the standards and the rollout. And I think there's been you know, industry working groups spending ridiculous numbers of hours arguing over standards. I think, okay, from what I'm aware of, what they're calling a smart meter is anything but. <laughs> it's just an automated metering interface. So if they get the design right, that's not a problem. 
you can connect it to something that is smart and can control demand in your home mm. or your business or whatever it is. And actually, I quite like that idea. I don't like the idea of there being a standard smart gizmo that might not be as smart as you want it to be or might be smarter than you want it to be. And you know, you can have some competition <coughs> and innovation on the smart gizmo end of things, provided you've got a standard secure interface. So if that's what they've done, is this is to define that secure interface, then it ought to act as a platform. But I'm just not sure in the working group, you've got some people who think it's going to be all things to all people. So there's that problem. For me, another problem is who owns it? Uh, so I think I'm right in saying that in Britain, we're the only country that's decided it will be owned by the retailer rather than by the distribution network operator. And I think, I don't someone correct me if I'm wrong, the theory is that, well, you've got competition among the retailers, so there'll be competition about installing them cheaply and getting cheap but effective devices, albeit conforming to this standard. But on the other hand, how often are you going to replace these things? They don't need to be replaced forever. If they've got the right interface to the smart gizmo that you can replace, you're just going to put it in there. How often do you have your meter changed at home? Oh, once every 20 years, or once every, okay, only because the old, uh, you know, disc things have been phased out, and you've got some little electronic thing, but they're not, they're not smart at all. So, you know, the distribution network operator is used to dealing with long life assets. Sure, there's not so much competition, but just do it once and do it adequately. Because the retailers are going to own these things, A, they're thinking about, it's not really the cost of the box, it's the cost of installation. So they're worried about recouping their cost. And they're also thinking how they can get best value out of it, out of this cost. And the best value is the information that it gathers. Mm -hmm. So the best people to make use of the information, I think, maybe you can see it from the, from the presentation, is the distribution network operator or the transmission system operator. They can understand what's going on, what demand is doing. They can characterize it over some time, you know, use some proper statistical analysis and get some better forecasting. With the smart gizmo, they can send some signal and ask it to do stuff to balance out the system and balance out that variability. But who owns the information? The retailers. They're going to sell it. They're not going to give it to the system operator. Uh, now, if they do something with it to enable some innovative products where you could, as a, as a consumer, you know, sign up for a tariff where they will take some responsibility for their whole pool of customers to do some of that balancing. Yeah, and there is an incentive on them to do that, then it's, okay, that's fine. It should all kind of work out. And there are some aggregators that do that now, albeit for mainly for bigger consumers, you know, chains of supermarkets or warehouses or, you know, big hotels, switch off the air conditioning for a bit. You know, they do that, and they do a really good job. It's really good to see. Um, but, you know, the, the big retailers, I don't see them really taking that on. Why not? Well, it, to be fair to them, it might be because the things are not severe enough yet to show the value it's still cheaper to reschedule gen a big generation. Over time, that should change. Uh, but I don't know, you just kind of wonder if it might just be it's just they don't need to because they've got this incumbent market. So there are some standards that like I said, I haven't followed them. They should be agreed. But who owns the data, I think, is a big, is a big question. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Just a quick one. I saw something at the bottom of one of your slides um, about smart meters linking to energy management devices in the homes. I was wondering whether that's part of the strategy for rolling out smart meters to actually help kind of control demand in the household. Yeah, I think that's part of the concept of a smart meter. Is is um, and one of the things that in principle that you do is to get a real time price. You know, so at this moment in time, electricity is cheap. So, okay, the original idea that uh, some of the civil servants had was if you had a real-time display of your consumption and there's a communication link that gets a real-time price, you can say, aha, I'm not going to have a shower now with my electric shower because it's very expensive. I'll wait an hour and get washed in. Well, okay, that's an silly example. But it's that kind of thing. It's supposed to inform choices, not necessarily about the total amount of energy you use, but at least the timing of it. So you can use power when the power is available, when it's windy or when it's sunny. Um, so originally it was thought, oh, just a real-time display will do. And there were some experiments that went on to see how people responded to that. And if you get some enthusiasts, they respond quite quickly and quite well. And after a while, they get bored. <laughs> uh, so it seems to me that what, what you really want is something automated that will do it for you. 
Hence what I was saying about smart gizmo. We're just defining the interface with the secure mean to get the price signal and measure the consumption because you have to pay for it in the end. But you can choose whatever box. You can set up a local area network that could configure your electrical devices. Maybe this makes more sense in a, in a business context, but it could make sense in a, in a home as well. So for me, I would want to be able to control that though. I don't want it to just do anything. But if it's set up in the right way, I can define some limits, some constraints, some rules, and it can respond to price information, even price forecast information, most useful, so I can do some scheduling, uh, and do what I want without me having to think about it. You know, minimum effort for me to buy the thing program. So as one example, I could say, right, I want the dishwasher to be finished by seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, I will have it stacked and ready to go at 11 o'clock. It takes say, 45 minutes for a cycle. You, Gizmo, work out the best time to switch it on. So long as it's finished by seven o'clock. And that might be at 11 o'clock, it might be at two o'clock, it might be at six o'clock. Uh, similar thing with, with the washing. If it's on, it's not happy to stack it up or whatever. It, and it could be a similar thing with electric vehicles. You're gonna charge your vehicle, just say to it, look, I want it as a full charge by the time I'm gonna to drive to work or whatever. Let it do it. So it just needs a little bit of, you know, like your Wi-Fi in the home to do this. This is why I think, you know, some innovation is already going on. Small companies are starting to kind of develop some of these things. And when it starts to get rolled out, and it becomes easy for us to use and to do, then I think we can start to make a difference. Does that answer the question? <laughs>